climate change impacts our world above the sea. It also has consequences below. Marine life is battling warming sea temperatures and diseases, among other issues. I'm Erica Zuko with our Environment Northwest team. Each week we share reports on what's happening in the natural world around us and how it impacts people in our region. We dive into what's impacting creatures beneath the water. There is one main focus at this University of Washington Friday Harbor Research Lab. So I'm just touching their little arm tips to wake them up. Here, it's all about sea stars. Yes. In this tank are full-grown adults. So these are our wild-caught adult stars that were caught in 2019. Vanessa Valdez is a research assistant here and shows off not just these large adults, but smaller, younger sea stars. There are varying sizes and they each come from different genetic crosses. All of these are each creating a lifeline. The reason that we're raising this specific species is because they're endangered. Uh, and the reason that they're endangered is because disease basically wiped them out about 10 years ago. Senior research scientist Jason Hoden says a decade ago, sea stars were everywhere along the West Coast. They were a very common species in a wide variety of habitats. That disease wiped them out basically everywhere, except for small populations in Washington and Alaska. Their loss causing a ripple effect. Sea stars tend to be predators. And what we've learned ecologists have learned over the last many decades is that predators are actually really, really important for maintaining biodiversity. When you lose top predators in ecosystems, the ecosystem goes haywire. So using that small population here as a base, UW is leading research in replenishing the big population. First, in 2019, they caught wild sea stars here in their natural habitat. So there are these pilings and there's a bunch of like organisms that grow on the pilings. Then bred them each year, creating a new generation of sea stars. The scientists start with tens of thousands of larvae. We've got these buckets um, with rotating paddles to keep the larvae flowing around. After a few years, that dwindles to just a couple dozen, simply because they get too big and there's not enough space here. Our sort of eye on the prize, as it were, is to be thinking about the possibility of reintroducing this species into areas like California where they've disappeared. So. What we're trying to do on a small scale is sort of give an idea of how one could maybe develop a larger facility in a place like California to raise thousands of these stars in, for possible release back into the wild. And the larvae they don't have space for in the lab, they release into the sea. Bon voyage! Even though the chance of survival is low. Hope they make it. They give them a shot. And after years of growth under these watchful eyes, the larger sea stars will eventually also be released with the goal of rebuilding this crucial species. We like to think that our research is basically contributing to increased knowledge about the sort of basic biology of a really important species that is on the brink of extinction and also finding out information to help restore that species in their natural environment. Digging for these guys is a tradition for people across the Northwest, and it's also a boost to industry along the coast. It's a pastime passed on for generations. Wesley, there's another one right there beside me. Five years old, my mom taught me how to plant big plants. Once I learned how, that was it. You had to dig your own. And I'm 58 years old, so that's a long time. A way to feel connected Three, four, five. to the coastline. You just hit the ground a little bit and the clam will, will react. He'll, he'll pull his head back down. Oh, there it is. If digging for razor clams is a Pacific Northwest art. Now, I'm not a professional at anything, but I'm an expert about everything. Making sure they're safe to eat is the corresponding science. Hey, good afternoon. I'm with Fish and Wildlife collecting interview data. Did you guys Biologist Bryce Blumenthal and other scientists dig for answers. I got me. They don't like this. Let's go. You got some <laughs> on beaches like this one in Grayland, they take tally of clam populations. You got your 15 clam limit? Both of us did, yeah. And sample the species to check for toxins, which can grind the season to a halt. The toxin that shuts us down most often is dimelic acid. Dimelic acid causes amnesic shellfish poisoning. Uh, in, in severe cases, it causes death and permanent brain damage. And, you know, in mild cases, it's, it's uh, an upset stomach and, and, a, and a pretty bad time. 
The acid was first to blame for closing razor clam digs in the 90s. And last summer, pelicans along the California coast died from eating domoic acid tainted anchovies. More than 20 people got sick from poisoned shellfish. Couldn't, couldn't grasp anything and hold it. That's when a Washington Department of Health lab first discovered domoic acid in razor clams, and it caused the state to cancel the rest of the season. Here's how the acid is formed. Sunlight, warm temperatures, and shallow water make algae grow faster into large blooms. We see lots of types, many harmless, across the Northwest. But one type, called Pseudonicha, can produce the toxin domoic acid. Razor clams consume it, and while it doesn't kill them, it can cause sickness in people and animals who eat them. Blumenthal says when tests show unsafe levels, fish and wildlife has to issue closures. Both Washington and Oregon have been forced to do so near summertime or around marine heat waves, though at this point there isn't a clear trend line over time. That's like the big question mark. Is this our new normal or is this like closure every other year? That's not the work that we do. Um, we just kind of manage the fishery and we just um, roll with the punches as they come. But some researchers are looking into what the future could bring. A recent study examined how a marine heat wave sparked a new domoic acid hotspot on the West Coast, and more work is being done to unearth trends. In the meantime, scientists and local partners have developed early detection and warning systems to help gain a better understanding of exactly which areas are impacted so closures only happen when and where they have to. There's a lot of people who come out here and, and uh, stay in hotels and patron local businesses, and so it's a huge um, economic driver for, for coastal Washington. Fish and Wildlife publishes data about acid levels at Washington beaches, and so far, 2024 testing has not revealed dangerous outbreaks. But they'll keep checking. Ah, there you are. Just like local clam diggers do. Got it? There it is. As they take part in this time-honored tradition. At a remote alpine lake in the South Olympic Mountains. This is a relatively natural lake that you might see kind of anywhere in the Cascades or Olympics in Washington. This is a nice garter snake. Home to abundant wildlife and an active ecosystem. Or other highly toxic critter in this area. Is, Max Lambert is on a mission. <sighs> the research scientist for Washington Fish and Wildlife was out on a hike when a mystery first surfaced. It's not rushed back to find a bunch of amphibians dying off. He spotted dead, rough-skinned newts with no clear cause of death, and some live ones that had red markings on their throats. Sores on his chin. Probably an inf infection. Now a study is underway to find out why. So get dirty. We hiked in with Lambert in late summer. The lake had shrunk, leaving thick mud behind. I told you glorping, didn't I? In search of newts and answers. What might be causing the animals to die in these large numbers for multiple years in a row? We our first dead newts up here. The first disturbing discovery came just minutes in, emaciated and bloated. I've never seen one that's actually like this swollen like this. Typically they're like all completely just totally desiccated. In the dried earth near the lake, several had washed up. Not a single live newt yet. He saved a few dead specimens for study before an adjoining pond revealed right some here. still alive. A little pool here, we got about six newts. Several looked healthy. Skinny, but okay. Others were more lethargic than normal. This part of the search also revealed more clues, as we found dragonfly and damselfly larvae in the water. They aren't starving to death because they don't, there's no food available. So was there another reason some weren't eating? Lambert gathered the newts, recording the condition of the dead ones. Pretty skinny, pretty emaciated, and their skins are basically cooked onto them and going further as he assessed the live ones. You can see all these rough glands along his back and tail. He recorded length, weight, and the characteristics that could show signs of what's going wrong. These are rough skin newt here on his throat. We see these two or three big defects, we call them. Probably an infection of some sort okay. on there. Oh, okay. He swabbed their stomachs and between their toes to test for the kind of pathogens and bacteria hikers or animals could have tracked in. It could also be a pathogen that's been here for 100 years and has been totally fine for all that time frame, and then climate change has triggered it to become a little more prevalent um, or impactful to the animals. He sampled water pH and temperature as they searched for potential causes. Whether pollution, climate impacts, or something else entirely are to blame, 
Lambert says cracking this case is about more than this common species. Everything's connected. These are, are good uh, pulse on the environment for things like climate change, for things like new pathogens. Um, they help us keep our ecosystems healthy. As for the newts themselves. All right, friends, time to go home. Thank you for your contribution. He released them after sampling with hopes that the healthy ones will make it through a full life cycle and prepared for the next step of the journey to find answers. It's peaceful in Kodiak, Alaska. An ecosystem where all species are reliant on each other. Hey, you got this one on? Good morning. Beautiful day here in Kodiak. Hey, good morning. A quiet day on the bay. Sounds like things might be slowing down out there a little. And that is the problem. Yeah. This is usually the time of year when crabbers are frantically getting ready for a long season, but this year is different. In a normal year, you'd have you know people walking back and forth, boats transiting from the dock over here to over here, putting pots on, getting gear ready. If anyone can find them, you can. So. Commercial crabbing is a family business for Gabriel Prout. Have a good one, Mike. We'll talk to you later. But commercial crabbing is once again canceled this year for snow crabs in the Alaskan Bering Sea. What's happened the last couple of years has been completely um, unprecedented and a complete shock and surprise to the industry. To understand the current crabbing crisis, we have to take a look back. Gabriel says crabbing has always been a staple in this local economy. Bering Sea crab fishing has always been a very lucrative business of guys coming back with a boatload of crab, making $100,000 in a matter of a month or two. And catch levels are tightly monitored by government leaders. Every year, information on the crab population is gathered by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and is reviewed by scientists and a council of leaders from northwest states to set overfishing levels. The state of Alaska ultimately sets the total for how many crabs can be caught each year based on NOAA's survey. So this is a, a male juvenile snow crab. For the first time ever in 2022 and now again in 2023, these scientists and leaders canceled commercial snow crabbing completely, something research biologist Aaron Fidoa says NOAA did not see coming. It was evidently a population collapse and that 10 billion snow crab had disappeared from the system. In 2018, there were an estimated 12.2 billion snow crabs in the Bering Sea. 2019 totals brought just shy of 5 billion, but no red flags were raised at the time. In 2020, NOAA canceled their summer survey, creating a gap in the data. Then in 2021, when the survey returned, the worst numbers ever recorded, barely more than 1 billion snow crabs in the Bering Sea, down 10 billion from just three years prior. I did uh, the bulk of the stations in the Eastern Bering Sea that snow crab typically inhabit, and it was very apparent that something was wrong. We dropped the net down at stations where we normally get thousands and thousands of those small juvenile snow crab, and they were virtually absent from those high density stations. She says simultaneous with that first drop in crab numbers, 2018 and 2019 brought record warm water, and that had many indirect impacts on the species, ultimately leading to a large scale mortality event. Those impacts now seen back to back years. You know, I do think for an Arctic species, the future is uncertain. Like I said, I'm an optimist, and I can only hope that the conditions continue to support you know, viable populations of snow crab. She says they're seeing increasing juvenile crabs now, but it could take years for them to mature to catchable size. Whether or not we see a lot of crab is all relative. If we see a lot of crab one year, it doesn't always mean that we'll see them the next year. I haven't got to reach, reach out to anyone yet. Families like Gabriel's are left waiting for those juvenile crabs yeah, to mature yeah. and hopefully survive. It's, it's extremely yeah. difficult. A species that for them that comes out to about 175. And yeah, makes up 80 to 90 percent of their income. And now multiple years of depleted income are catching up. We're at risk of, of losing our, our small family uh, fishing businesses, second, third generation fishermen families. For more environmental stories, text environment to the number on your screen, 206-448-4545, and we'll send you a link. For Environment Northwest, I'm Erica Zuko. Thanks for watching.